Hello and welcome to Musical Pathways, the podcast which focuses on the different pathways musicians take in order to reach their musical goals. Today we're going to be talking to another teacher here at Musical so that you can get to know us all a little bit better. And our guest today is a percussionist extraordinaire with a wealth of drumming experience. For his career, he's been involved in multiple bands and has had the opportunity to play in many pits throughout the county, including the famous Minak Theatre. Along with teaching at the Cornwall Music Service, he has now come into the team here at Musical teaching the Pops course, along with more in the future. And today we have Ross Hamilton. Hi, Ross. Hi, Gary. Cool. So as I said at the top, we're going to be looking a bit more into how you've developed as a musician and how you've gotten your skills, basically, to get where you are. And while we're doing this, I'm sure we'll have some stops along the way and chats about music in general. So the first question I like to ask is, um, what role did music play for you in your early years when you were young? Um, at the time, I never really thought about it because it was always there. Uh, both my parents were music teachers at some point in their lives, and we had um, a piano at home. And so it was always in the background, literally or <laughs> metaphorically. Were they secondary or primary teachers or um, instrumental? They both did secondary. My mum also taught primary. Okay. So they you always basically have built-in music teachers? Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. quite handy. I was going to say, very handy if you want to be a musician. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Couldn't ask for a better start than that. Were they always playing music themselves or was it more that they were listening to a lot of music or how was, how was their like career, I guess, in a way? Like what... What role did they play in that sense? Mainly listening. Uh, yeah. So they they would be listening to music, and of course I'd hear it um, before I knew, I suppose, really what it was or what I wanted to listen to. Um, it, it was either just on in the background or um, something like that. And then I started playing piano when I was about five. And who encouraged that? Did you want to do that, or was it just kind of? Did it just kind of happen, like fall into it? I think it just kind of happened. I don't remember. It was it was quite a while ago now. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember exactly um, whether I, I requested it or whether it just started happening. But um, like I said, having a piano at, at home meant uh, that was an easy thing to start doing. Yeah, and um, I, I think um, pianos have got that added benefit where although they require technique to get amazing at, you don't need any technique to make a note. You know, to make a sound out of it, you just need to push down a key. Yeah. And I think for little kids, that can be really encouraging because, you know, you can do that by accident. By mm. accident, you can create music. I know my daughter loves, like, the keyboard because of that same reason that, you know, you, you push a key and a noise comes out. Yeah, and exactly. it's just fascinating if like or inclined to be into music so yeah it makes sense and then when did you move on to the drums then at the time there were very few uh primary schools that had drum lessons if any um it was a it was a much more niche thing so secondary schools tended to provide that i guess that might have been because of space and so on and probably um, just affording a kit for a lot of... Cause where, did you grow up in Cornwall? I forgot to ask. Where, where, yeah. where are you from originally? Cornwall? Yeah, that's where I was uh, brought up. Yeah, and, and so was it a small yeah, a small primary as well? Yeah, a small primary school. Um, and I, when I ha was having piano lessons, I was having them outside of school. Um, I don't recall there being visiting teachers to the primary um, at the time. Um but then when I moved to secondary school, there were more options for um, having instrumental lessons. Um, and I had seen, towards the end of my primary school years, uh, a performance of Carmine Verana in the cathedral. All right. And I saw these guys at the back with all these amazing instruments um, and having a whale of a time playing that piece. Uh, so I think that's what got me hooked. And then uh, I started having lessons at, at uh, secondary school was it percussion then more than kit that like drew you in or um i guess it was in the first place because of the fact that i saw that piece being played yeah um but was able to have lessons on drum kit and percussion 
Um, so they kind of run concurrently and side by side. I I found picking up percussion and drum kit um, relatively easy, it seemed at the time, because I'd had a few years of experience playing piano first. So yep. I knew a little bit about music theory and, and notation and rhythm and that kind of thing. So I was therefore just mainly working on technique and uh, developing musicianship in other ways. Did you have the same drum teacher then all the way through secondary school? Yes, and a bit beyond. Okay. What, what was your next step after secondary school? Did you go? Uh, I went to a different secondary for sixth form, um, as my first secondary didn't have a sixth form uh, college attached, and continued with lessons there, um, expanded into playing other kinds of, or with other kinds of groups, I suppose, um, at that bigger place, and um, got my first experience of playing for musicals and things like that while I was there. You, you've done a lot of musicals, and what was your first band like then? Was it was it within a musical, or was it within a band that you did your first kind of proper performance, if you like? I think probably performing percussion uh, in a group would have been a school production of Sound of Music. Oh, that's, um, that's not a bad start. <laughs> a long time ago. Um, and then uh, I mean, there was some school jazz bands and that kind of thing. Yeah, that's quite cool. Um, and then I went to Helston Sixth Form um, joined the Helston School Jazz Orchestra, um, which I was playing with for about three years. Um, and alongside that, I was part of the Cornwall Youth Percussion Ensemble yeah. and the Cornwall Youth Orchestra um, for about four or five years each. Um, and all of those experiences kind of helped to me progress as a musician, um, both in terms of being a performer, but also kind of understanding how music works more right, yeah. internally. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that's quite a varied amount of style and difficulty within a lot of those different genres and groups i guess yeah a real mix yeah a real mix of things and i think that helped me to be aware of a lot of different styles of music that i hadn't previously been aware of yeah so more contemporary music um that because i mean you know percussion ensembles aren't <laughs> haven't been written for for hundreds of years like some orchestras and, and so on yeah um, so music was, was all relatively new anyway. Um, so being able to play in that kind of group. Kind and, of pushed you playing forward a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's right. What, um, what was your, what was your favorite performance you've ever done then? Um, I don't know that there's a particular favorite that stands out because there's, there's been lots that have meant a different things for different reasons, I guess. Okay. Um, I, Give I, us a couple. Well, I was I auditioned to perform a percussion concerto while I was at university in my third year, and I performed a marimba concerto by Ney Rosaro <laughs> uh, in City Hall in Cardiff. Sounds tricky. Multiple mallets. Well, it was. I mean, it, it was my first kind of solo performance on percussion. A, a, a lot of the time, especially in orchestras, you're part of a group of 50, 60, 80 people and yeah. you're part of that group although there may be only one timpanist you're still part of a bigger group and yeah. just that difference of being the soloist out front with the orchestra behind you um was quite a bit different from i guess it's what that I've experienced before is it that difference between like being a supporting role as opposed to being a leading role i guess isn't it you know when you're when you're sat back at the back you're kind of all supporting whoever's up at the front which sometimes is a group and sometimes is an individual but taking that actual leading role it's got to be a big jump yes i mean and also it had required me to um develop a more rounded marimba technique uh and i needed to be able to play things that i hadn't been able to play before so i had to develop my technique to accommodate the piece and it you know it took probably a good six months to prepare the piece yeah and it was over in 15 minutes <laughs> <laughs> i've done it 
but it was a great experience it was obviously big enough that you remember it now yeah so it was worth it it was worth the time because it's, yeah, it's had a big impact in you long term if you like yes yeah have you got another another one that sticks out or i performed with uh the band i was in at the time called four tons of funk at Panworth week oh yeah um in a big marquee outside uh on event square there um and that was a really good night i bet that i was bet that had a good atmosphere actually yeah the bouncing <laughs> was great really good yeah yeah i always find um Falmouth generally has a good atmosphere you know there's lots of like um music going on in that area anyway isn't it so that they're open for it they're yeah. ready for it yeah absolutely with that in mind what is um what's the thing that you really enjoy with music is it that playing in those big groups and ensembles or is it kind of at home like practicing by yourself i mean you did that with a marimba practicing by yourself a lot i would imagine or is it yeah. is there another aspect that really kind of sticks out at you as as the bit that makes music the thing that's for you i think it's that thing of having either if it's just yourself if, as a soloist or as in a small group or a band or a bigger ensemble that that all those individual people are actually working together collectively to project a performance to an audience yeah and whatever else those people might be able to do in their work lives or free time or anything else at that particular moment you're all kind of just working on the same thing yeah so like that kind of melding of the minds yeah like you you all become become one for three minutes and 50 seconds or whatever it is yes that's right yeah, yeah. and it projects that sense of unity to an audience i've always thought like um with percussionist groups especially you know, when you get those percussion lines where you're filling in each other's parts, I always find that that there must be some kind of like melding of the rhythmical mind there as well. You know, where you, you've got one beat that kind of goes over two bars and then one other beat just kind of drops in in all the gaps of the other beat. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what, whatever instrument you play, there's a, a degree of that almost not, not psychic, but uh, a sense of... <laughs> Um, and it, it helps a lot if you have played with people for a long time together that, that you can be... Um, you can kind of predict each other's patterns, can't you? Yeah, and you can rely on the fact that they're going to do what you expect them to do at the time that you expect them to do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was saying before, because like bass players and drummers tend to get a fairly like intuitive relationship with each other, and... Um, I was saying before, I know I've played with drummers some for quite a long time and I can almost predict the rhythm that they're going to put in the fill before they've even started playing it and, yeah. and join in with it because I just know that even if they've never we've never played the song together before, I can just predict what they're going to put there from the feel of the song. Mm -hmm. And I think it is, it's almost, it's not quite psychic, like you said, but it's like, um, I don't know, you just you you're able to um understand each other to an extent where you're you know what the other person's going to do and you can react to that in a musical way yeah 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 no i think i think that is great and and i think it's that thing that keeps coming up in all these podcasts is actually the um it's the human relationship in music which is the the bit that a lot of us love you know it's it's not the bit practicing at home as important as that is the actual bit that a lot of us love is the actual performance and being within those groups yeah but um if we can have a look at that sitting at home practicing by yourself but how have you developed your kind of learning process and how has that improved as you've gotten older were you always quite academic with your learning or was it has it increased as you've gotten older or decreased I was not always the most practiced student, that is to say, I, I didn't necessarily take to practice um, as much as I, I should have done at the time. Well, your students um, just heard that, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it, 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 it's just true for them, it was awesome for me, I think. And, you, you know, you take a long, a longer term view over it. Yeah, and um, I, I think that is the way to look at it, really. Yeah. I think, I think learning an instrument's a bit of a a long-term build isn't it you know 
Yes, I think um, I think if if the practice that you do leads to a result a result that you can realise and you notice, then that can spur you on again the next time. Whereas if you're stuck in a rut on a particular bit that is, you know, no matter how many times you do it, doesn't seem to be getting any better, then that can be a bit um, counterintuitive. Yeah, but you know. There, there could be a different way to approach it or a way you hadn't thought of doing it before, changing the rhythm of it to slightly to start with and then bending it back and, and that kind of thing. And I think from as I as I do more teaching, it makes me think more about my own playing. Yeah. yeah in terms yeah. of if how I'm trying to explain to a student how I go about a particular rhythm or, or whatever, then it makes me think, how would I do it if I if I'd seen it for the first time? Yeah. I think like I think the way in which you if you're teaching as well you end up with like four or five different ways in which to teach the same process depending on the student as well. Yeah. You know, they they might be very small variances or they might be quite vastly different but but I do think it really shows how different we all are when it comes to learning an instrument. Um but how ultimately we can all get to the same end goals. Just some people have to kind of come at a different angle, don't they? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Is that is that the kind of methodology you take to your teaching? Is that like the kind of things you say to your students to encourage them to progress? Or I, I would try and get them to explore different ways of learning, uh, whatever stage they're at, in the sense that if, unless you try it a different way, you won't know if that works better for you or not. Yeah. I mean, I've had students who are much, much better at learning by listening. Yeah. And others who are able to work out rhythms themselves just by looking at it and imagining how it sounds. And yeah, then that yeah. comes with experience as much as anything else. Do you do you try and do you try and encourage the variance? Like, do you try, during your lessons are you kind of it's as opposed to um, trying to get them to kind of plow on on the same thing to be able to do what they're doing rather than getting them to do that do you encourage them to try different ways or do you tend to just go around a different way of getting to the same end if that makes any sense um i think it depends on the student it it and how engaged they are with the piece if they really like the piece but i find it really hard to play yeah then we might go away from the, the sheet music completely um for a while and just get to know the piece in a in a different way, just the, the kind of structure of it or the speed of it or um, what instruments are playing at different types of listening out for the, the melody and the chord changes and all those kind of things where without realising it, they're, they're kind of getting to know the piece better so that when they then come back to trying to play their part in as well, yeah, um, they've, they've established more about, more knowledge about the piece than they've realised. Yeah, I always find that, especially for rhythms, like um, listening to the piece like a few times over and just tapping it, I get loads of my students just to, whenever we're learning a piece, I I try and, rather than getting them to go out and just learn the piece, I normally tell them to listen to it the week before we're going to play it. Yeah. And just to listen to it over and over again and tap their hands along to it. And when you know a piece kind of inside out, then fitting the rhythmic part into it becomes so much easier you know when you've got to really focus down on things i think it um it almost like takes too much of your brain power you can't focus on what you're doing because you're listening to the track too much yes and uh, and funnily enough it, it can be a little off-putting if a, a student is learning a, uh, a the drum part for a song that they know because they start thinking about the song too much yeah or playing the rhythm of the song because they know it pretty well. Right. Even yeah. if the rhythm that they're supposed to be playing is is not the same. It's just a you know more of a pulse or a, a regular uh, part of the accompaniment. Um, but they start just playing the rhythm of the tune. Right. Because I was going to say because there must be a difference because obviously I'm getting people to listen to the drum beat and in most situations if you're listening for rhythm you're listening to the drum beat. But if you are creating the drum beat, kind of like a different angle to hit there, hasn't there? Because you are 
you're creating the part that everyone has to sit on. So if you don't create that part correctly, then their parts can't sit on it correctly. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a difference if you're, like you say, making up a part to go with other things that exist already and there's nothing to refer to. So if you're yeah. busking, basically, yeah, you've, you've got certain parameters which exist for everybody, like the tempo and the time signature. Yeah. Um, and then you've got those variables within that um, which can be developed as a group sometimes um, if you're writing your own song as a group you might um, discuss with the bass player about when the um, rhythms are going to come where the notes are going to come yeah do you, do you focus them more on reading initially as opposed to um, actually composing drum beats because I know, like, through the Pops course, there's a lot of re- reading kind of, like, rudiments and getting your hands ready, but that's quite, obviously, early early in someone's learning. What's what's the kind of next steps from there? Um, I think the development of the technique and tone production from an early stage is very important because it will mean that everything that there comes out thereafter is a lot easier to achieve right if you've got to fix a, a ball grip or something on the way to getting to a a decent bounce roll or something like that then that takes time and you have to unlearn something that they maybe not have learned before but have just adopted or adapted um a way of holding the stick or something like that yeah i i had a i had that problem when i was when i first had my first bass lesson my teacher looked at my hand and he was like why is your pinky finger stuck out like that (laughs) (laughs) and in my left hand i had like um he called it um tea service you know like how old drinking tea with your pinky in the air my pinky used to just like stick straight out from the bass and it was an absolute nightmare to fix it you know because that was probably i want to say four or five years into my playing Mm. and i basically had to relearn all of my left hand technique again because i just didn't use my my pinky finger which obviously you know it cuts the amount of fingers you've got to use down by one and that Mm. means you're like one slower if you like (laughs) yeah because you've got less available to you and yeah it was a nightmare like if i if someone when i'd started had gone use your pinky finger and i'd listen to them then it would have probably cut me half a year just playing this exercise that I had to play for like half a year to get my fingers to work properly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. Like getting a solid foundation is only going to help you later on and prevent you from having to do this like reparative process, which is like almost counterintuitive when you've already learned one way. Yeah. And I, I think the thing about rhythmic notation particularly and getting used to reading or having having a basic understanding of the note different note, note values and how they fit with each other and, and then how that fits with a um a bar it means that when you then talk about how to construct a beat and which beats are important and um how different kinds of notes relate to each other and how many you can fit into a bar and that kind of thing yeah it is it has a a relevance then do you find that that stuff is particularly important when you're doing like shows like theater type stuff like where you're not necessarily leading you might have someone conducting to lead you but but you need to know exactly how it should be sitting if that makes sense just by reading the music um but a lot of shows have got written parts um for for most of them there, there might be some um room for improvisation within that or you know, extending the part, extending the rhythm um, from what's written as, as sometimes what's written is very basic. Um, but on occasions where you're uh, busking a part which you haven't, so you haven't got a drum part to read from, you're maybe following a piano score if you're lucky. Um, yeah, knowing what style the music is in and given that style, what sorts of rhythms might be most appropriate to use um, for for the grooves and for the fill-ins, most appropriate use of 
the parts of the kit, so cymbals and bombs and cowbells and all those other kinds of sounds that you would probably expect to hear in that style of music. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you don't want like in a, um, I don't know, in a, I'm trying to think of something wildly inappropriate, like a jazz song with just the crash on every beat, something like that. Yeah, <laughs> no, probably wouldn't wouldn't suit it quite. Wouldn't go down well. No. Yeah, that's the um, that's the general rock thing is just um, crash on every beat. Real good, <laughs> real good. Do you teach a varied style of music in your lessons? Then is that in order to get that kind of background information? Do you kind of encourage your students to do that yeah i try and uh touch on the the kind of the three main stylistic groups as i see them for drum kit anyway rock and pop type stuff jazz and swing and latin american right okay and where they sometimes cross over with each other and also encourage them to listen to various artists in those genres that will actually make them better players of that style I think you you get better at playing in a jazz style if you listen to some yeah so you, you get to know the kind of idiosyncrasies of the style and how the instruments relate to each other in a slightly different way in that kind of group that they would do in a rock band or who, who are you thing. listening to at the minute then who's on the um and what what of the three styles do they fit into I'm not listening to anybody in particular at the moment although I did recently um, and I bought it on CD. That's how rare it is because it's, it's not even on <laughs> download uh, anywhere that I could find. I bought um, one of the Chick Career Electric Band albums. Oh, amazing. Um, after he passed away, it got me thinking about it again. And it was an album that I had first heard when I was um, in my teenage years. Um, and it spent several of those years just permanently in my car tape player on on, on loop um and i i don't i haven't listened to it i suppose for a good 20 years since then um properly so and i thought i must go back and revisit that because it you know it was part of the the background to my development and and some of the guys who played on that were just amazing musicians and when i first heard that kind of thing at that age i was Slightly blown away by it all. Yeah, I mean, he he was just a master at, at harmony, and I I just think he picked some just crazy rhythms. I remember when I first heard, or I actually saw someone play Spain, which yeah. is you know your classic Chick Corea song. But when I first heard of Chick Corea and I saw someone play Spain, and I just remember being mesmerised by what was going on in front of me. You know, like all these just notes just so many notes and then you come away from it and you can remember parts of it and you know sometimes it's very rare to be able to be both memorable and complex you know yeah. that, that's a very fine line to tread because you know if you're overly complex you're not going to create something that everyone's going to remember but i could sing that lead line from spain for probably a week or two afterwards yeah. And he was just so good at getting that kind of perfect medium in the middle, wasn't he? Yeah. And I mean, and that kind of group actually is a good example of that thing I was talking about, about the mix between different styles. So there are elements of pop and rock in it, and there's elements of jazz and elements of Latin all kind yeah. of m- mushed together in the in a lot of the stuff that he played. So it, it's a good, if you are a, well, any musician really, and you want to, get into those kind of styles it's a it's a nice way place to segue because it has got influences from all of them and although it's complex i mean you're you're not going to be doing this from the beginning but if you're a bit older and you've been practicing for a few years it's a nice place to segue because it it still does have parts of each of those three areas yeah absolutely and where does um where does music now affect you as an adult? I guess bringing it right back around, we've, we've heard about kind of what you've been doing for your life. What well, what role does it play in your life now? I mean, you're obviously still a teacher, so you're you're playing, you followed in your parents' footsteps to some extent. And you're to teaching. some extent, although they, they went more down the classroom route. 
Yeah. Um, where, and <laughs> perhaps it's partly because of the experience that they had and how uh, exhausting it appeared to be um, that I didn't do that. Although I, mean, I did train to be a um, classroom teacher. Yeah, um, I think a lot of us did. And I, 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 I did as well. Yeah, and I think it does take a a braver person than I to follow that path. Quite so, yeah. yeah. But I mean, you know, I make a living from music now in one way or another, either through teaching it or playing it. Yeah, is that where it ends for you? If that makes sense, or or is it still kind of all around you in day to day life as well? Yeah, it's still around me. I think all all the time. I, I, Come out, coming at it from a different angle now, I guess. Well, not just now, but for a, a few years now, since I've been teaching, is that you you think about it in a slightly different way. I think. Yeah. And I quite often don't. Well, sometimes I don't have music on at home as a sort of break from it. Yeah, yeah. I, so I listen to, to speech radio a little bit while I'm at home and I'm in the car, and then you kind of become a bit refreshed to music again afterwards. Yeah, I think that's a good tip because your your ears can become a bit like um, dulled with music. I, I read an article a little while back and they said kind of where music is in every aspect of life now, almost, mm. it's kind of running in the background. It it can mean that you get a bit dulled to it and don't really pay attention to it when it's on. So I, I get why you take a break. I know I've I've taken breaks from music all the time and just not big breaks but like you know a, a day <laughs> without yeah. any music and then you, when you come back to it you you properly listen to it again but i know it, it can just where it is in life all the time now it's kind of nice to have a break from it and then come back to it and then you can engage with it properly i think you listen with different ears almost when you come back as well it's, it, you, or you listen to the same piece of music on a different audio system you have yeah listen to it in the car or at home or headphones or whatever you hear things in it in it that you hadn't heard before especially if you had a break for a, a little while and then come back to it and listen again yeah i've got i've got that thing where i um i just tap all the time and i have right. to try and i've got to try and remember what i what i'm, I'm tapping you know i'm just be walking along tapping a rhythm i'm like oh what is that from <laughs> and i spend yeah. like half the day tapping the rhythm from the advert that's just been on the telly so it it i do um i do get it <laughs> but you know even on days when you're not particularly trying to listen to anything you just go for a walk and you'll get a tune in your head just randomly um that you probably haven't heard for two or three years all of a sudden it pops in yeah and it's like you can't get it out of your head again i know yeah, and then and then you've got to go on the um on the hunt to try and find it if you can't remember the name straight away. It's a yeah. it's a hunt through the back catalogue. So luckily we have Spotify and ways in which we can find music that you know if we had lost a CD 10, 20 years ago, it would have been lost forever. But we can what's the word? We can narrow down a bit more now. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, it's been great chatting to you, Ross. And I hope that the listeners out there have grabbed some inspiration and they want to go out and grab their instrument and have a practice and a play, maybe listen to some Chick Korea. Do it. Yeah, do it right now. Remember, every path leads to a goal eventually, so make sure you take every single one you can. And until next time, bye. Bye, guys.